Hey, this month we've been in a series called The Ripple Effect, and The Ripple Effect is kind of something I discovered as a kid. I loved throwing rocks uh, in different ways. A lot of young boys do. One day I threw a big rock into a very still pond, uh, and it made a big splash, and I loved it. But then the next thing I saw is this completely still and calm water suddenly had ripples that were going out from the splash, and it made a difference. Specifically, it made a difference in the attitude of the fishermen just around the way who really liked the water being calm. He didn't like the splash, but I was fascinated with the ripple. And I've thought about this in life that a lot of us, we love splashes. We love to make a splash. It means you notice me, you see me, or something benefits me. A splash is all about me, but the ripple is something different. The ripple is something that goes beyond me. It makes an impact beyond me, maybe even further than I can see. And really, what we talk about the ripple effect is the ripple effect is, is God. He wants to do something that's all about what he's doing in the world. He wants us to be part of it. You were created with influence. You were given influence. Every single one of you has influence. The only question is, will you be intentional with it? Or will you be casual? Because you can, all, all of us will make a difference. It's just what kind of difference will we make and how big and how serious will we take it? But a ripple effect is basically you do something and it goes beyond you. And it really is all about starts, starting with one small act and trusting God that he can take the ripple to go farther than you think. And today specifically, I wanna talk about what does it look like to intentionally invest in somebody else? Not doing something randomly or casual or a random act of kindness or a random gift or something like that, but, but having another person and saying, I wanna intentionally invest in their life. Because chances are all of us are who we are today because somewhere along the way, somebody did that. Somebody invested in us. Last week, we talked about having I see in you conversations. Somebody came to you and said, I see something in you. Or maybe they didn't. But I promise there's something in you that needs to be noticed. But again, it's not being noticed because it'll be a splash, but there's a gift, there's a gifting, there's uniqueness to you that people sometimes need to call out and say, you should grow in this area. You should use this. I wanna talk about what do it look like for us to life on life intentionally invest in somebody else. Has anyone ever done that for you? Can you think of any names of people who did that? Think about who they were and what they did well, what a difference it made. And I'm not talking about somebody who's on a stage like this and a lot of people in the room. I mean like sitting across a cup of coffee or having a conversation. Not in a classroom, but face to face, life on life. And have you ever done that for anybody else? Sat down, just had a one-on-one -on -one conversation where you tried to invest in them. A lot of people, when they hear something like that about investing in somebody else, they think, well, it's not me. And it's either because they don't think they can, they don't think it makes a difference, or maybe they just don't know how. Well, today, I want to look at kind of the modern, or for us, that can help us today, the poster board for making an indifference and influencing in others. And we call it by different terms. It's investing, coaching. In the Bible, we talk about disciple, discipling somebody. In the world, we call it mentoring. You know where the word mentor comes from? It's an intimidating word because you think, well, I, I could never be a mentor. That, that sounds too intimidating. The word mentor actually comes from Homer's poem. And it's not this Homer. <laughs> not this one. This one right here, this guy. Homer was a Greek poet who wrote, two kind of classic poems. They're called epic poems. I don't know. They seem okay to me, but I don't know about epic. But they're called epic poems. The Iliad and the Odyssey. And in the Odyssey, the story that, that's told there is where the word mentor comes from. And Odysse uh, in, in the Odyssey, Odysseus uh, wants his son Telemachus. Anybody name their kid Telemachus in here? Not many of those left in the world. Telemachus, he wants him to be influenced, so he asks a guy named Mentor to do this. Go to the next slide. Mentor, that's the person's name, was given the task to give an education of soul and spirit as well as mind. An education in wisdom and not merely information. That's where the term mentor, if you ever said, oh, so-and-so was my mentor, or they mentored them, or that's their mentor, that's where it comes from, that somebody was trying to help somebody experience not just information, 
but wisdom. And not just of mind, but of soul and spirit. And that's where the term mentor comes from. But mentor is a very intimidating concept. It's really a pretty simple one. Mentoring, it could be defined this way. Here's the word, what mentor means. Mentoring is a relational experience, life on life. Not like a setting like this, not even a classroom, a life on life. A relational experience in which one person empowers another by simply sharing God-given resources. What we've said in the ripple effect is what God gives you is never just for you. He wants to use your God-given resources that he gave you to impact others. And it's not just stuff. It's experience. It's wisdom. It's your learning. Anything that you have, God's given you, but it's not just for you. He wants to use you to do something through you with what you've experienced. I mean, it's both a a verb and a noun. A, A mentor is something you are, but it's something you do. You mentor, you disciple, you coach, you guide, you teach, you assist, you invest, you equip. But it's also who you are. It's your identity. You were made by God to be an influence on others. And sometimes it starts with one conversation, one word, one life, but life on life. And the poster boy for this we're going to look at, if you have a Bible, you could turn to the book of Acts. If not, I'll share mine with you on the screen. But in the book of Acts, and again, in the Bible, the book of Acts is not like the thing you use for chopping wood or the body spray. It's Acts, like actions. And a lot of people call it the actions of the disciples or the apostles. It's really probably more like the actions of the Holy Spirit as God works through them. Well, one of the people who did this really, really well is in the book of Acts, but you might kind of skip over him. Uh, It's not the person that made the biggest splash, but I think it's the ripple effect poster boy because he shared his God-given resources in a relational way that empowered somebody else that we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for what he did. And in Acts chapter 4, you read about this guy named Joseph. And Joseph, this is a picture of Joseph. He took a selfie. Uh, Back then, you couldn't do it with the camera, so he had, I don't know how he did it. I guess he painted something like that, but that's his selfie. And Joseph was a Levite from Cyprus, but the, the apostles called him something else. They called him Barnabas. And so maybe they changed it because there's a lot of Josephs in the Bible, Ah, uh, Joseph, do you mean the guy with the coat of many colors? No, that's Donnie Osmond. Do you mean the guy with the, uh, with the, around the manger? No, that's Joseph and Mary, different Joseph. Maybe there's too many Josephs. But really, he earned a nickname. It says, they called him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And it says that he sold a field he owned, and he brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Son of encouragement has nothing to do with the fact that he gave a big gift, but he did. That's what mentoring is. You're sharing your God-given resources relationally in the life of another. He takes some money, and I don't know if it was a big novelty-sized check, you know, that said, I don't know, like $5,000, like V-O-O-O, like that's Roman numerals. But but I don't know if like he had a big, like novelty-sized check, but really his nickname wasn't about like Daddy Warbucks or Giver of Big Bucks. It It had nothing to do with that. Son of encouragement, it's a Greek word. It means to come alongside... And to call someone to come alongside. And encouragement, it means to, to it doesn't mean, uh, encouragement doesn't mean, hey, nice hair or nice outfit. Encouragement means to infuse courage into somebody. To come alongside somebody, actually to invite someone to come alongside and infuse courage in them. That's what encouragement is. To help somebody maybe be encouraged, infused courage to take a step they didn't think they could take. So he's encouraging the apostles who Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. They hadn't traveled within a couple days of their home, 30 miles of their home. Now they're supposed to go into all the world and tell people about Jesus, the one they just killed in a very violent way. They needed some courage. Well, Joseph said, I can sell a field and give you the money to do that. But he did a lot more than that. You don't see it here, but you see it kind of in the background all through this book of the Bible called Acts which is a history of the first followers of Jesus. And this guy, Joseph, he earns a nickname based on what he did. And what he did well is he infused courage into people. Have you ever gotten a new nickname? How many have at least one nickname that's not your given name that people call you? Raise your hands. 
most of us. And if you don't know it, probably is. Somewhere in the world has a nickname for you you don't know about. But I've, I've had a number of nicknames in my life. I actually have a list. I keep it going. My name is Douglas Allen Holcomb, but no one ever calls me Douglas Allen Holcomb. My nicknames are Doug. That's what I go by. Dougie, Dougie Fresh, Dig Doug, Doug Bug, Pastor Doug, PD, Chappy, Chap, Chappis Maximus, DH, The DH, The Godfather, Dog, The Dog Father, Sebastian, Hulk, The Incredible Hulk, Talcum, Talcum Powder, Doug Alita, Snuggy Dougie, Snuggy, Snuggless, and Little Bubba. No, and, and it's a great, I, I added one to the list this week. Someone said, I'm going to call, call you this from now on. I'm like, all right, just add it on the list. But I've never gotten a nickname by how well I invested in others. It's all based on, oh, you know, that rhymes with your name. Dougie Fresh is my go-to. I've been called Dougie Fresh by more people than any other nickname probably. Just because it's something you can do with the name. It's, it's a play on the name. Joseph, like Barnabas, they're not even similar. But they looked at Barnabas and go, no, you know what your name is? Your name is son of encouragement. Like you are born from encouragement and you infuse courage in others. That's who you are. I dare you to do something that earns you a new nickname by how well you serve and invest in others. Because Barnabas did. And the rest of the book of Acts, sneaking around in the background, you see exactly why he did that. He had a bigger impact on the Christian faith maybe than anybody else aside from Jesus. I, th I really do think more than anybody else, I think he had the biggest impact. And let me show you why. Acts, Acts chapter 9. So, the Apostle Paul, who most people would say, aside from Jesus, he probably had the greatest impact on Christianity. I mean, about two-thirds of the New Testament, God used him to write it. He planted churches everywhere. Jesus said, go into all the world. No one seemed to go except Paul. He went everywhere. He was beaten to a pulp. He died for his faith. I mean, I mean it, it, bigger impact. So he decides one day he's going to start following Jesus. The problem is the previous day on his to-do list was to arrest and be part of killing people who follow Jesus. So suddenly when he says, hey, I'm going to follow Jesus now, and he goes to Jerusalem and knocks on the door and says, hey, uh, 11 disciples, now 12 disciples, because you replaced that one guy. Hey, disciples, I'm with you now. They're like, no way we're letting you in. Not, we're not going to let you in. You don't, this is a trick. You're going to arrest us or whatever. So he here is talking about the apostle Paul who they believe is still out to get Christians. When he came to Jerusalem, Paul, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him for good reason. Friends of their, they'd been to funerals recently for people that Paul had a hand in killing simply because they followed Jesus. Not believing he was really a disciple, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them Saul's story. Saul was riding to go arrest and kill Christians, got knocked, knocked off his donkey, and suddenly Jesus shows up and says, why are you persecuting me? And Paul becomes, I'm now with you. I'm not against you, I'm with you. I'm following Jesus now. And Barnabas changes the story for Paul. He could, Paul could have easily been left out. But Saul says, hey, I know this guy. He's good. I've seen God working in his life. And he literally and figuratively opens the door for Saul, who later became known as Paul, to have a relationship with the disciples, to be discipled and mentored by them, and then to be unleashed and live for the ripple effect. Barnabas is the change agent in the Apostle Paul's story. And probably are, chances are, many of you have a but Barnabas moment of you were in a certain place, but somebody came into your life, said something, did something, made an introduction, challenged you to more, called you out on something. I don't know what it is, but some of you have had one of those but Barnabas moments. For me, it was a, there was a but Gil, but Gil showed up in my bedroom Come see me and have a talk with me. My parents want him to have a talk with me to try and straighten me out. And to this day, Gil Strickland is involved in my life, challenging me and encouraging me. I mean, he's been there, even when I was at my worst, but he's opened the doors for me. And then I got to college and I got in Bruce, but Bruce introduced me to a place where I could start serving in a leadership role and grow in my leadership. And the person he introduced to me, but Chuck, had me on his staff as an intern and then an associate. And then we got together and we planted Live Oak Community Church. 
Chuck and myself and Doug Garrett, who was playing keyboard today. And we were serving together, and then we planted a church together, Live Oak Community Church, in 1993. Chuck was a huge hinge in my story, but Chuck saw something in me. And then, but Scott, but Scott, one day he said, I, hey, have you ever thought about this part of your, I see something unique in you, but I see in you something. Would you maybe start starting to pioneer something at a certain high school where we're trying to reach high school kids? Okay. He introduced me and set me up there. And then one day he introduced me to a guy named Ron. But Ron had to play my story because he saw gifts in me and challenged me and was very discerning and very truthful and straightforward. There were a lot of awkward conversations with Ron. But Ron was a hinge point in my story that changed the direction of it. There are so many others that have done that for me. Who's done that for you? But the big question is, who are you going to be the Barnabas for? Where their story is going one direction and then you step in and have a conversation. You encourage something. You affirm something. You open the door. You make an introduction. You believe in them when they don't believe in themselves. You do something. You could be the one who brings significant change into someone's life. But the chances are you may not see that. Because a lot of those splashes by Gil and Bruce and Chuck and Scott and Ron and others, they were just a little splash at the time. But the ripple kept going and going and going in my life. You never know what one investment can do. And it comes down to, will I live for the ripple? Or just, do I just want to make a splash? Later on, at Acts chapter 11, and what's a turn of the page, some of the times this is long periods of time, but something starts happening and suddenly the first followers of Jesus were all Jewish. That's just the way they all were. And then as news of Jesus started spreading, people who had never been connected to the Jewish faith started following Jesus. Well, the problem is the first Christians just kept doing what they did when they were Jewish. We're going to do the same festivals, and we're going to do the same meals, and we're going to do the same surgeries. Like, like all this stuff was going on, and suddenly these people who were non-Jewish, they were Greek, started becoming Christians, and the Jewish and Christian people, did, or, or, or Hebrew, uh, Greek and Hebrew people, didn't know how to mix Christianity with both of these. So as this place called Antioch, non-Jewish people started becoming Christians they didn't know what to do with it. And the news reached the church in Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas. Here's the thing about Barnabas. Here's why he's a great ripple guy. Like, he, there was something about him that people knew. If we don't know what to do, I bet Barnabas does. He had skill set. He had experience. He had a reputation. He'd earned the right to be heard. He'd earned a reputation where they go, let's send him. Like, you, you have a reputation. And there, I hope and pray, there's some situation that goes on in the world where someone says, hey, let's send you. You know who would be great for, let's send them. Like when you live for the ripple, you build a reputation and they knew Barnabas is our guy. That could have gone to Barn Barnabas' head. He could have just become a splash guy. I want people to look at me. I want people to know me. So he arrives in Antioch. And he saw, if you want to make a difference in someone's life, just stop and be curious about people. Look, see where God's working and join them. Look for an opportunity and say, God, how can I help? Go to that person and say, how can I help? He looks, he simply saw what the grace of God had done. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He goes, you guys are great. Keep going. Encouraging. And then it describes who he was. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Who you are, your character, your integrity, your faith, who you are, who you are when no one's looking, who you are matters because it sets you up to be someone that God can use. But if who you are is a train wreck and a mess and full of faults, you're just like the rest of us. <laughs> Sometimes we just hide it better or we live in the grace of God and just say, God, I messed up. I'm doing a U-turn. I want to go a different direction. And that's the Apostle Paul. He was a mess. But it wasn't about him. It's what Christ had done in him. And when you're full of the Holy Spirit and faith, you have something to offer. 
It's not about you. It's not your ripple. It's what God can do through you. So Barnabas was a person that God could use. And because of that, a great number of people were brought to the Lord. But Barnabas doesn't make it about him. Here's what he does. This is the genius of the ripple effect mindset that he had. The next verse, verse 25. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Why did he do that? Everything was going great in Antioch. For two reasons. I think Saul, we know him now as Paul, could help. And two, Barnabas knew I can help Saul. I can mentor him. I can coach him. I can disciple him. I can invest in him. Paul can help and I can help Paul. And that's the reality. Why some of us get struck up in mentoring relationships is we think one of them needs to be the teacher and one needs to be the learner. Most of those relationships that I had, it was mutual encouragement and benefit and investing in one another. It's not always top down. Sometimes it's life on life, side to side. And as you read through the book of Acts, and Barnabas is subtle in the background, Paul's a big player, and it starts saying Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul throughout Acts, and then it switches and starts saying Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, and then it's just Paul, 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 Paul. Like you mentor and you invest in somebody, then you move on to who's next. But here was a chance to invest in Paul, and he knew Paul had something to bring to the table. So he brings him to Antioch. Sometimes the best thing you could do is say, hey, would you ride shotgun with me? Let's go, let, I'm going to do something, would you go with me? For a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church. What is a turn, what is a few sentences, a few words, is a whole year. Investment over time always leads to impact. Investment over time, it's not a cup of coffee. It's a whole year of cups of coffee. It's a whole year of serving together. And Barnabas and Saul are meeting with the church and they're together and there's investment going on with them and they're investing into others and it creates ripples that we still feel today. Because look at this next sentence. The disciples, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. If you ask people today, what their faith background is and their followers of Jesus, the most common answer is usually Christian. That didn't show up until Antioch. Talk about a ripple effect. The word Christian means little Christ, a small version of Jesus, a disciple. I, I'm becoming more like him and helping others do the same. And in the first time they were called Christians was in Antioch. And we still think about that today. And Barnabas didn't care. No, let's call them Barbas, Barnabas followers. Let's call them, or Barnabas, hey, I was a part of that. No one's talking about me and what I did at Antioch. Barnabas didn't care. He didn't live for the splash. He wanted to make a ripple that would do something. And we're still feeling the impact today. And one of the reasons we still feel the impact isn't just because of the word Christian. It's because this investment he made in this guy named Saul, which was his Jewish name. Paul, which was his Roman name. And Paul becomes this force who invests in others. He invests for them over time. And Barnabas earns a new nickname from Joseph, which means son of encouragement. He brings others up to his side and he infuses courage. Christians earned a new nickname. And I thought Barnabas was probably more excited about that than about his name getting changed, than about what he was doing. But he invests in Paul, and Paul starts going out, and they're going together, and they're doing things. And one day they bring along this guy named John Mark, who's a young up-and-coming follower of Jesus, now a Christian. He's a disciple. And John Mark wants to go with him. <clears throat> and then, then he gets sick, and he can't go. He leaves, and he goes home. Then he says, okay, I'm better now. I want to go on your next trip. And Paul says, no. I can't bring along someone who literally doesn't have a stomach for this. And Barnabas says, no, let's bring him. Because that's what we do. We invest in others. And Barnabas and Paul, <clears throat> these two people who have been side by side, Paul's mentor, get in such a heated argument that they part ways. And Paul takes somebody new with him, a guy named Silas. And Barnabas takes John Mark with him. And he believes in him. John Mark, you may have gotten sick and you may have actually had one of those deals where you got a test coming up or there's a bully at school and I'm sick to my stomach, I don't want to go. It may have been one of those things, but that day doesn't define you. I believe in you. 
Now Barnabas is having an I see in you conversation with John Mark. Well, that's a good thing. Because John Mark goes on to write a letter or, or, or a book of the Bible called the Gospel of Mark that we have today. Paul said, I don't have time to invest in you. I've got, I'm on a different speed. Bar Barnabas is like, I'll wait. I'll wait on you because I believe in you and I see in you. And this ripple effect starts and Barnabas did it for Paul and Paul did it for Silas and a guy named Timothy. And actually, 2 Timothy 2.2, we read this. Go to 2 Timothy 2.2. And the things you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust the reliable people who will also be able to be qualified to teach others. So here's what's happening. Paul's telling Timothy, the guy he's discipling, mentoring, coaching, and training. He says, the things you heard me say in the presence of others, so you heard it from me, I want you to tell others. And Paul could say, I heard it from Barnabas, you heard it from me, who's gonna hear it from you? And that's actually a great question. This is the ripple effect, we see it playing out. Barnabas invests in Paul, Paul invests in Timothy, Timothy invests in somebody else, and then somebody else, and then somebody else, and eventually got to you. If you're a follower of Jesus, it eventually got to you. You experienced the ripple. But not just for what it would do for you, but what God would do through you. Now, now, who are you gonna be a a someone who says, you'll teach others, you'll pass it on to others, you'll share, you'll invest, and you'll instruct. And again, a lot of people are like, well, I'm no teacher. Or I'm no mentor, or I'm no, no, no disciple. Or like, that's just not in me. You're right. It's only in you if Christ is in you. But I would say you're more influential than you think. And it's all about focusing on this connection, this relationship, this life on life. Many people want to live for a splash, put me on a big stage or give me a big platform. But really the most impactful platform in the world is one life connected to another. At Live Oak, we say it this way. This is one of our core beliefs that everybody needs to be connected to somebody. Everybody needs to be connected to somebody. And that life on life shouldn't be passive. It should be intentional. There should be something happening there that benefits. The question is, what will I do with the connections I have? And will I live for a splash, something that's for me, or be about the ripple? Here's a simple plan, a simple way. If you wanna be someone like Barnabas, the poster boy for the ripple effect, here's, here's a way that I've thought about it for years, that this is my game plan. This is the playbook and I got it from Barnabas. It's simply this, learn and grow all you can. Learn and grow all you can. Read the Bible, take notes, be invested in by others. Be, make sure that something is pouring into you. Be a lifelong learner, seek it out, be teachable. But it's not learning just so you'll be smarter or know more or grow more. It's not about you. You learn and grow all you can, then you identify whoever you can. For Barnabas, it was, hey, I'm gonna give some money to the apostles. Seems like they got a nice little startup business going here, this thing called The Way, Following Jesus. I think we may rebrand that to Christians, but I think there's something going on here. I'm gonna invest in them. I'm gonna sell a field and lay money at their feet. It wasn't a startup business. That was an act of worship for him and an act of discipleship. He said, I'm gonna invest in the disciples. He goes, hey, wow, this guy, Paul, they won't let him in, but he's got something. I see something in him. So he knocks on the door and opens the door and gets him in with the disciples. And he's like, I want to bring this guy with me with what I'm doing. He'll make me better. He'll make this situation. He can have value. He can have impact. God could use him here. And then he kind of lets him go. And then he goes, well, who else is? Oh, John Mark. John Mark's got a tummy ache. But I see something in him. I can help him. You identify whoever you can. Then you invest in them as much as you can. And if you want someone, if, if you want to invest in someone's life, they should show up on your calendar. It should be time invested, time, um, love over time, investment over time. It always makes an impact. You invest in them as much as you can in different ways, and then you do that for as long as you can. And if you simply sat down this week and thought, how will I seek to learn and grow this week? Who is someone I could invest in? And it always starts as a small investment. You don't have to set up a big long-term uh, pen pal relationship or something like that or mentoring relationship. It could be that, but it could be just like, hey, let's have coffee. It could be a passing com comment when you say something. Hey, I noticed something. I see something in you. Invest in as many ways as you can and do that for as long as you can. And if you keep doing that, I guarantee you the ripples that we'll, you'll be a part of are 
that will go further than you can think and make a bigger difference than you can imagine. Here's a real simple way to think about it, kind of like, kind of as a cycle. Commit to being a lifelong learner. For the rest of my life, I want to learn and grow as much as I can, which means it should show up on your calendar. You should have a plan. And then you commit to lifelong investing. Anything I learn, I want to apply it to my life and then think, who else could benefit from this? And then you go back to learning more and investing more and learning more, investing more. And if you do that, how different would our world be? My world is different because Gil and Bruce and Chuck and and Scott and Ron and others did that with me. So who will you do that for? And again, this is not a transaction of information. It's life on life. Here's, Here's what the Apostle Paul said to one of the groups he was investing in. And he had this ability to invest individually and in large groups in huge quantities. So it's intimidating. But really, the reason Paul was changed is it was a life on life with he and Barnabas. And so he told the people in Thessalonica, because we loved you so much, there was a relational connection. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, that was of first importance to him. But he just just didn't want to make converts. He wanted to make disciples, disciples, and fellow members of the family of God connected. The gospel of God, but our lives as well. He said, I didn't just come and teach you. I gave my life to you. I invested in you. You want to make a difference in someone else's life? Don't just tell them stuff. Love them. Serve them. Invite them into your life and see if they invite you into theirs. Don't force yourself in, but invite them into yours. That's what Barnabas did. I want Paul to join me with what I'm doing. Relationships is where life change happens best. If for whatever reason, that's God's plan, that relationships would be the vehicle he uses to share not only the gospel, but life as well. That they would be so interconnected. So learn and grow all you can. Identify whoever you can. Invest in them as much as you can and do that for as long as you can. But just do something. Take one step. Think one person, one way you can learn this weekend. Just ask that question, who could I pass this on to? And as you're passing on the information, invest your life as well. Open up your life, be authentic. Because really, we're not just called to go mentor people. Jesus' word is much more intimidating. Because in Matthew 28, he he told us this. Jesus said to his disciples, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. He's in charge. It's his ripple. It's his story. Our story is too small a thing to live for. His story is too great a story to miss out on. Because he's in charge, he simply says, go and make disciples. Go, take initiative, take steps. Make disciples, people who are learners of Jesus, who are becoming more like Jesus. And do this everywhere, all over the world. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded, which means you've got to be learning that. And then you think, I can't do that. And he says, great, I can I am with you always to the very end of the age. I'm always with you and I'm never leaving. So let's go. Like this week, you may not need to show up on the other side of the world, but you need to show up in someone's world because that's how life change happens. And chances are somewhere along the way, someone did that for you. You might even think back, what did they do that was so effective with me and see if that could be a benefit. Just do that for somebody else. Or if no one's ever done that for you, think, What do I wish somebody had done? And then go do that for somebody to make sure that they don't miss out on it. You were called to make a difference in the world. Some of us think, I've got nothing to offer. God created you. So you have something to offer that he gave you by design. I can't do it. That's great. He's with you. He'll give you the power. I don't know how. Look at people who do it well. Look at the Barnabases. Look at Jesus, how he did it with his disciples. Look what the disciples did and learn from what they did but do something to invest in others because if you live for the splash, it's very short-lived. If you live for the ripple, it'll be a story you'll remember and you'll talk about in eternity. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. Hey, next Sunday, you know, Jesus said, go and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're doing that next Sunday. I don't know if they ever had pool parties, but we're gonna do it at a pool party. So um, I doubt any of the first church had water slides, but we're gonna be at the Tech Leisure Pool 
And at 7.30, we're gonna do baptisms. We have a lot of people that are lined up to do that. We want you there to celebrate them. Uh, and then hang around after, and we're gonna enjoy the pool, the leisure pool, and have a good time there. It's next Sunday evening, September 5th, at 7.30 p.m., the Tech Leisure Pool. Hope you can be there for that. Because that's going on, we will not have our normal streaming service at 8.30 p.m. Every, I don't know if you know this, but every Sunday at 8.30 p.m., we restream this message, uh, and it's, we, we kind of nickname it Live Oak After Dark, but it's a chance for people who serve, who maybe couldn't attend, or to invite others, and we actually have some people that sometimes uh, tune in that that's their only Live Oak experience is tuning into that one. So we won't do it next Sunday, but that's something to be aware of. Next Sunday here at Live Oak is a family Sunday. It's uh, Labor Day weekend, which means kindergarten through fifth graders will be in the room. And we're actually next Sunday kicking off a, a new series called If Then. And, uh, you know, some, have you ever heard someone say that sometimes the Lord works in mysterious ways? Ever heard that? The Lord works in mysterious ways? Well, that's true. But sometimes the Lord works in some not so mysterious ways too. There are some things he created in the world that are principles of the how, how life works. That when you understand that, it could be a game changer for helping you uh, build a thriving faith and make a difference in the world. Hey, speaking of the great commission of, of going to all the world and make disciples, as you leave today, for those who are here online, I wish you could be here to see it, but those who are here uh, on the back wall as you're leaving, uh, we have something for you to see that highlights God's great mission. And as we focus on spreading the gospel across the street, across the globe, and in the next generation, this gallery uh, exists to connect you and your family to some missional resources. Uh, feel free to scan the QR code uh, at the Mission Gallery to learn more about the Mission of God class, the cultural exchange program for, through Texas Tech University, as well as an opportunity to make some meaningfully uh, deep connections to the global missions in your family, small groups, and through prayer using the Unreached app. Uh, I encourage you to spend some time and look at that. Uh, it'll, it'll be, it's educational, and I hope it's motivational to encourage you to step in in another way into God's great mission. Let's pray together. God, thanks that you love us, and thanks that Barnabas... Uh, he didn't just write a check. Like, he invested his life. And he, he bet on the Apostle Saul, or on Saul that would become the Apostle Paul who became a key contributor. Um, right, one of the people he used to write the New Testament and start churches. And, and, and Barnabas invested in Paul and Paul invested in Timothy and Timothy invested, Timothy invested in others. And somehow it got to me. And I'm really grateful for that. But I don't just want to sit and enjoy the waves. I, I want to get involved with the ripple. I want to be a part of what you're doing to reach the world and to invest in others. God, thanks for the people that have invested in us. Use us this way in some specific tangible way to invest in the life of another, to live for this, the ripple, not the splash. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for being here. Stop by the Mission uh, Gallery as you leave.